If you will turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19 as we continue our study through the word. So you'll remember that there was a great drought that was upon the land that King Ahab, wicked King Ahab, had been approached by Elijah and he said, not until I pray will these skies open up and give rain. And you remember that Elijah then went into hiding and for three and a half years there was a great drought upon the land. And, and you remember that Elijah then was sent back to King Ahab to come and, uh, and to face off with the prophets of Baal there up on Mount Carmel. And you remember that, uh, that the prophets uh, of Baal were all conducting themselves. They both made an altar, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and, uh, and they offered their sacrifice first, and then they cried out to the Lord uh, all day and, uh, and up until the, the hour of prayer, the evening sacrifice. And then Elijah cried out before the Lord, and you remember that in fire came down and consumed Elijah's sacrifice. And, and really it was a call. Choose you this day. If Baal be the true God, then worship him. But if Jehovah, then worship Jehovah. And so the people rose up, you'll remember, and they then slaughtered the, the prophets of Baal, the false prophets and uh, and you remember that Elijah went and bowed down and prayed. And, and you remember that the storm cloud came in off of the Mediterranean. And you remember that he told Ahab to depart. Otherwise, his chariot was going to get stuck in the mud. Now, remember, three and a half years they hadn't had rain. And now Elijah's telling them, you better get going or you're going to be stuck in the mud. And so off Ahab went and... And you remember that Elijah himself also was directed by the Lord then to depart. And, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of the Jezreel. And, uh, and so Jezreel was where Ahab's winter palace uh, was. And it was halfway between Mount Carmel and Samaria. And so here we see that uh, that now no doubt uh, with this action, Elijah must have felt that Jezebel and Ahab now would turn to the true and the living God, that now God had made himself manifest there and had demonstrated with this mighty display of his power and glory that, that the nation was to turn back to God and that, that there would be this great revival of all of the people, that the whole nation that had gone astray would, uh, would now be called to a unity and to a solidarity with God's great demonstration of his authority and power. But we are going to see that anything but that happens. And Elijah is going to depart and run for his life as Jezebel now is going to seek the life of Elijah. And so let's watch as God meets Elijah uh, as he now has been faithful in being obedient to the Lord. It's been quite a three and a half year journey for Elijah, hasn't it? You know, first there was the, the, the departure from the community to where he now had to go and, uh, and receive and be fed by ravens uh, by the brook. Then he had to go out of the country and be ministered to by a widow. And so for three and a half years, Elijah has been obedient to the Lord, but has gone through an awful lot in his own life. And now he faithfully 
culminates all of this with, uh, with the great sacrifice and, and the cleansing now of the prophets of Baal. But rather than seeing a great restoration and now Elijah in this place of restored community in relationship, we see that, uh, that there is a backlash that comes against uh, him from Jezebel. We see in verse one here of this 19th chapter that it says, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. And so Ahab runs back and tells Jezebel that the prophets have all been slain. And uh, and now we see in verse two, and then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, praise the Lord, (laughs) right? Shouldn't that have been the, you know, you've opened my eyes to the true and the living God. And now I want to surrender my heart and my life. Truth has been made manifest uh, here. And so I will gladly follow you and walk in your ways. But we see instead that she becomes angry and vindictive rather than being open to receiving the truth that was evidence to everybody. And so she says in verse two, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So she sends a message to him. Hey, by the way, there's a contract out on your head uh, now. And in 24 hours, uh, I am going to have you executed. And so here is the, here is the response. And, and it says in verse three, and when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. So, you know, here we see that uh, that Jezebel is out to get him. At a time when you would have thought that that in Elijah's life that he would have had this reprieve now. He would have entered into a time of rest and blessedness. He had been faithful to do what God had called him to do. And now we see that the consequences of his actions doing exactly what God had called him to do is that he's in trouble with Jezebel and now his very life itself is endangered. And so a contract is put out on his life. And sometimes when we serve the Lord, we have that expectation that we're going to enter into rest and that there is going to be this blessedness. And uh, and instead, it it can seem like suddenly there's a contract uh, on our life when suddenly things aren't falling into place, but it feels like things are falling apart. And so certainly with Elijah, And now he has to literally run for his life. And it says in verse three, and he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. So uh, Elijah now departs uh, from uh, Israel, which was the, the northern 10 tribes. He goes all the way into Judah and then goes all the way through Judah all the way to Beersheba. So uh, he has gone about uh, uh, 80 miles uh, south from, uh, from where Mount Carmel was. And we see that Beersheba is the southernmost uh, town that is in Judah. And so an, an expression that you'll find in the, in the Bible oftentimes in dealing with Israel is it'll say from Dan to Beersheba. Now Dan is the northernmost uh, town and Beersheba is the southernmost town. And so from Dan to Beersheba would mean the entire country, uh, an expression or an idiom. Here he runs from the north all the way through the south, all the way down to Beersheba. And then that's not enough because after Beersheba is just the desert and the barrenness that is out there beyond there. And so he leaves his, uh, his assistant there and he keeps right on going all the way out into the wilderness uh, uh, and departs uh, now. 
And so we see here that uh, that he is running for his life, that that now he himself is afraid. Now, I want you to know it's interesting because he is struggling with the fear of Jezebel now rather than entrusting in God's provision of safety in his life. And we see that fear has gripped him. It's interesting because this is a very issue that he was ministering to the widow at Zarephath. You'll remember back in chapter 17 when Elijah says to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. She was afraid that there wouldn't be enough provision. And he said to her, don't be afraid. Just just be obedient to the Lord and you're going to see the provision of the Lord. So he was able to minister to others, but now in his own life, when his life is threatened, we see that he becomes afraid and he runs and he goes all the way down to Beersheba. And then from there, he leaves his servant there. Verse four, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And so he is exhausted. He has run all the way uh, down and, and now out into the wilderness. And, and he comes upon a, uh, a broom tree. That's a desert bush. It can grow to about 10 or 12 feet tall. So not a huge tree, but something that was significant enough to be able to give him some shade in, in the heat. And now he takes some refuge underneath this broom tree, having you know run to, to this place of exhaustion, this place to where he, he has come to the end of his resources. And now underneath this tree, it says he prays. But look at what his prayer is. And he prayed that he might die. <laughs> and he said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. He is tired of the calamity and the difficulty and the hardship that has been in his life. He's been serving the Lord, but it hasn't been easy to serve the Lord. And, and sometimes we can get to this place in our own life where we are walking with the Lord, but it becomes difficult to walk with the Lord. It becomes hard. We feel like, you know, God is just going to meet all of our needs and take care of everything and, and things are going to go smooth for us. But, but we live in a culture that, that is going opposite the way that the Lord would have us to go. And so when the Lord tells us to follow him, he leads us to go against the culture. And now all of a sudden we have this adversity from the culture that we never had when we were going downstream with the culture. We didn't even notice that there was a stream of the culture until we turned around and started to try and walk up against it and started to notice and experience the power of the culture that is heading in the opposite direction. And sometimes we can experience woundings and hardships and difficulties from that. And, and we're like, man, Lord, this, I surrender. You know, I mean, I am tired. This is hard, Lord, this is hard. And I want you to know that Jesus had told us that it would be hard. He said that broad is the path and smooth is the way that leads into destruction, but narrow is the gate and difficult is the path. Uh, and so he, he has called us onto this journey. Elijah is wearied. He's tired. He's exhausted. He has been facing hardship physically in his life. He has been living in this place of absolute total dependence upon God for his very sustenance. He then goes and, uh, and delivers the message uh, and now his own life is in peril. He's had to run for his life. He's out in the middle of the wilderness and he's like, that's it. I quit. <laughs> I'm done being a prophet, uh, you know, and, and, and here's this calling that has, you know, been on his life and, and now it's hard. It's enough. He was so discouraged. Think about this. So discouraged that he says it would just be easier to die. Lord, just take my life, you know. And so he is in a hard place in his life. 
You ever been in a hard place in your life? You ever been in a place where just, where just, it's not working? And you find yourself compressed on, on every avenue. When you've got more problems than solutions, more hardships than, than answers. And it feels like things are just kind of closing in on you. I want you to know that's exactly how Elijah felt. And, and it wasn't because there was sin in his life. There, it wasn't because there was compromise in his life. It was because he was being completely obedient to what God was calling him to do. And so he just has this moment of fatigue, of weakness, of collapse underneath the, the broom tree. He has a pity party for one. <laughs> pretty good one too he's been through a hardship he's been through a difficulty it, it has been a trying time in his life and we see that that he says it's it's enough lord take my life i want you to know the man that had just prayed and asked god to open up the heavens and and, and to bring forth rain and god had answered that the next recorded prayer that we have of him is saying lord take my life <laughs> i want you to know the lord doesn't answer that prayer <laughs> and sometimes it's a good thing god doesn't answer our prayers because some of our prayers, <laughs> it wouldn't be good if the Lord answered those prayers. In verse 5, And then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. And so he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. And so he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God, as far as Mount Sinai. God brings him all the way back to Mount Sinai. Back to where God met with Moses and where the law was given. And we see here that, that God provides for him manna in the wilderness that sustained him for 40 days in the same way that God had provided manna in the wilderness that sustained the nation for 40 years. And God meets us. And he sustains us and he helps us when we turn to him and when we cry out. And so he comes to the, uh, the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, a distance of about 200 miles that now he has to travel. And it says that in verse 9, and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> what a great question. <laughs> Elijah, what are you doing? You're running. You're afraid. You're not walking in trust. You're not walking by faith. And so he calls to Elijah and asks that. And in verse 10, we see Elijah's answer. And so he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Lord, I'm the only faithful servant that's left on the face of the earth. Everybody else has turned away. And, and it can feel like that sometimes too. It's easy to get discouraged when we see things moving in the opposite direction that God would have them to. When you feel like you're making a stand, but it's not making any difference. 
Maybe you can feel like you're trying to make a stand in your house, but that's not making a difference. Or you're trying to make a stand at your work, and it's not making a difference. Or you're trying to make a stand in your neighborhood, and it's not making a difference. Or you're trying to make a stand in your school, and it's not making any difference. And, and you can feel like you're not making any difference. Am I the only one? Am I the only one that's, that's passionately pursuing God anymore? Is everybody else lukewarm? Has everybody else turned away? And that's how Elijah is feeling. And so verse 11, it says, Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. We see here that when it says that the Lord was not in the wind, there's this great wind that breaks forth and tears into the mountain and breaks the rocks in pieces be, uh, before him. Can you imagine how terrifying that had to be for Elijah to experience just the raw power of, you know, of a hurricane force wind that suddenly comes and rips through and tears through the mountain? But the Lord wasn't in it. And what does that mean? It means that, that the wind was not the instrument of revelation of God. That X was a mighty earthquake and ground shakes. And here's Elijah, you know, he's never been in Southern California before. So he's, he doesn't know to go stand in a doorway, you know, <laughs> duck underneath the desk. But here he is, you know, I mean, he is just being shaken around. And, uh, but, but what happens? But, but God doesn't reveal himself in the earthquake. That's not his vehicle of revelation of himself. And then we see there's a great fire. And, and again, the power of a fire that burns forth and the noise of a forest that is on fire. And suddenly there is a fire that tears through. But God doesn't reveal himself to us in a fire. How does God reveal himself to us? How does God speak to you? How does God speak to me? And it says right here, in a still, small voice. This is how God reveals himself to us. This is how God speaks to us. And so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elisha? <laughs> I'm watching the wind and the earthquake and the fire. <laughs> In other words, have I directed you here? You're a prophet of mine, underneath my direction. And suddenly he <laughs> abandoned ship and ran for his life. But you see, God never calls us to run from the battle that he has called us to. He's not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and might and sound mind. The battle that he calls us to, we will certainly prevail in that battle. But here we see that Elijah has run now thinking that he needed to spare his own life. But is not the very giver of life capable of sparing Elijah's life? Is God not a more formidable protector of your life than, uh, than you are able to defend and to protect yourself? And so he says to Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're in the flesh. 
You're trying to take care of yourself. You're about self-preservation and instead of just obedience and trust in the Lord. And he got scared and his fear caused him to get a grip over him. And in our lives, fear can have a grip on us. We can get frightened in the challenges and the battles and the situations that we're facing. But Jesus told us, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear not. The number one command in the Bible, negative command, do not be afraid. Do not let fear drive out faith in your life to where now you're being governed by fear instead of being led by the Spirit. And it doesn't matter how seasoned a saint you are. It doesn't matter how passionately you are serving the Lord or how mighty you are being used of the Lord. Here we see Elijah struggling now when his life is threatened and takes off to preserve himself. And so God calls him to a meeting to minister to him. In verse 14, he says, and he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left and they seek to take my life. He says, I thought I already answered that. (laughs) Back in verse 10, Lord. (laughs) Gives him the same answer a second time. Verse 15, then the Lord said to him, go. Go. Get back to where you belong. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. And also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshai, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. And so we see that through these three men, these are all up in the the northern section, that God would complete the purge now of the Baal worship that Elijah had begun. So he was saying there's no other faithful men, and here we see the faithful men that are going to continue the purge that that Elijah had begun. And then verse 18, he he also ministers, and he says, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And so the Lord lets him know that he's got a remnant. He's got a remnant. God always has a remnant. And so, regardless of what's happening in the nation or in the world, God always has his faithful people who will not compromise, who will continue to burn bright and to stand true and to stand upon the solid rock of the word of God, upon the power of the Holy Spirit, and will reflect the character of God into the darkness of the world that is around. God always has a remnant. And so, verse 19, he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the 12th, and then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and my mother and then I will follow you. And so here we see that throwing the cloak around a person symbolizes the passing of the power and the authority of the office to that individual. And so Elisha turned back from him, took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. And then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. And so here we see that 
Elijah had said to him, and he said to him, go back again for what have I done to you? That means do as you please. What have I to stop you? And so he gives him permission. And in verse 21, he then offers the, the sacrifice. Chapter 20, we see that Ahab now, who is the king over Israel, we are going to watch him as the Lord is going to give him a mighty victory. Not because he has been serving the Lord or he is deserving. And, uh, and God bestows blessings upon us, not because we're deserving and because we have earned it, uh, but because of God's goodness. Amen? Favor undeserved favor. That's what grace is. And so God is going to show grace to the nation of Israel, even though they are being disobedient. But that grace upon the nation doesn't mean that that is a validation that they can continue to do the things that they're doing. If you are not walking right with the Lord and you experience grace from God, don't take that as now permission to continue to be walking apart from his will for your life. Grace is divine favor that's unmerited and unwarranted. And, and we're going to see that, that God blesses him and the nation delivers them mightily from the Syrian army. But, uh, but then we are going to see that, uh, that Ahab does not rely upon God. And we are going to see the consequences uh, of that again. So verse 1, chapter 20, 1 Kings. Now Ben-Hadid, the king of Syria, gathered all his forces together. 32 kings were with him, with horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and made war against it. And so uh, here we see that uh, that this was the son of the Ben-Hadid who Asa had hired to attack Basha some years earlier. And now allied with him were 32 other kings. So there were 32 kings that came with them. So impressive array of kings that were aligned and then the collective troops of these 32 kings that were there. They were probably the rulers of the neighboring city-states. And, uh, and so a full formidable force. Verse two, then he sent messengers into the city to Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, thus says Ben-Hadid, your silver and your gold are mine. Your loveliest wives and children are mine. And so here we see the message comes in. Give us your silver and your gold. Give us your women and your children and send them out and we will not attack you. And so you can imagine when that came to, to Ahab now, the fear that came into his heart. Surrender now your women, your children, and your gold. In verse 4 it says, And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, just as you say, I and all that I have are yours. And so Ahab is greatly outnumbered, and so he now submits to these terms. And so he is going to uh, surrender. And then the messengers came back and said, Thus speaks Ben-Hadid, saying, Indeed, I have sent to you, saying, You shall deliver to me your silver and your gold, your wives and your children. But I will send my servants to you tomorrow about this time and they shall search your house and the houses of your servants and it shall be that whatever is pleasant in your eyes, they will put it in their hands and take it. So now we see that Ben-Hadid ups the ante. Before it was just the silver and gold, your wives and children. But then when he added their PlayStation 2 uh, on top of everything else uh, here and their big screen TVs, that was the end of it right there. That crossed the line uh, now. They were not going to surrender this. And so the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, notice, please, and see how this man seeks trouble. For he sent to me for my wives, my children, my silver, and my gold, and I did not deny him. And all the elders and all the people said to him, do not listen or consent. Therefore, he said to the messengers of Ben-Hadid, 
Tell my lord the king, all that you sent for to your servant the first time I will do, but this thing I cannot do. And the messengers departed and brought back word to him. So the word now goes back to Ben-Hadid. You're asking too much. Your first petition I will grant, but I will not uh, grant the second petition. In verse 10, it says, Then Ben-Hadid sent to him and said, The gods do so to me, and more also, if enough dust is left of Samaria for a handful for each of the people who follow me. And so the king of Israel answered and said, and Tell him, let not the one who puts on his armor boast like the one who takes it off. <laughs> So uh, here we see that, uh, that the answer there, I, uh, I like that. Uh, don't count your chickens, what? Before they hatch, you know, don't boast uh, uh, before you put on the armor like the one that takes it off, meaning the one who boasts after the victory uh, versus the one who boasts before you even have a victory. And it happened, verse 12, that when Ben-Hadid heard this message as he and the kings were drinking at the command post, that he said to his servants, get ready. And they got ready to attack the city. So here we see that, that now in the middle of the day, it's hot and, uh, and so not a lot is happening here. In verse 13, suddenly a prophet approached to Ahab, king of Israel, saying, thus says the Lord, have you seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into your hand today, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now remember, God had already demonstrated himself there to King Ahab on the top of Mount Carmel and demonstrated that I am the Lord, but Ahab didn't bow the knee. Now, here is a mighty army. 32 kings are, are, are now gathered uh, against him. And, uh, and so here we see that, uh, that now uh, he comes and, uh, and tells them that the Lord is going to deliver him so that they might know that he is the Lord. In verse 14, and so Ahab said, by whom? Who's going to lead the, the army? And he said, thus says the Lord, by the young leaders of the provinces. And then he said, who will set the battle in order? Who's going to organize them? And he answered, you. <laughs> And so now God tells them to, to go and to muster up the, uh, the, the young leaders of the provinces. And then he mustered, verse 15, the young leaders of the provinces. And there were 232. And after them, he mustered all the people, all the children of Israel, 7,000. And so they went out at noon. And meanwhile, Ben-Hadid and the 32 kings helping him were getting drunk at the command post. Uh, now, in the middle of the day, because it is so hot, uh, not a lot of activity takes place in the heat of the day. The morning and the evening uh, are the active times in, in the middle. Siesta. And so uh, here they were in the middle of the day there. Uh, and they're getting drunk at the command post. And, and the young leaders, verse 17, of the provinces went out first. And Ben-Hadid sent out a patrol. And they told him, saying, men are coming out of Samaria. So he said, if they have come out for peace, take them alive. And if they have come out for war, take them alive. <laughs> And so, uh, so it's not clear to Ben Hadid, these men that are coming out, whether or not they're coming out for war or whether they're coming out to negotiate further terms of peace. He says, you know, either way, just capture them. That's what I want you to do. In verse 19, it says, then these young leaders of the provinces went out of the city with the army which followed them and each one killed his man. So the Syrians fled and Israel pursued them. And Ben-Hadid, the king of Syria, escaped on a horse with the cavalry. And then the king of Israel went out and attacked the horses and chariots and killed the Syrians with a great slaughter. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said to him, go, 
Strengthen yourself. Take note and see what you should do. For in the spring of the year, the king of Syria will come up against you. And so here we see that Ahab was warned now that Ben-Hadib is going to come back. He's going to uh, uh, attack in the spring. And so uh, Ahab was warned to build up his defenses. And, and one of the things that this really speaks to us in is the way in which the Lord warns us so that we're not surprised by our enemies. The way that the Lord gives us a heads up when we are heading into trouble, when we are heading into battles and gives us awareness uh, so that we might be victorious. God has given to you every single thing that you need to be successful and to walk soundly in your life with him. He prepares us. He equips us. He strengthens us. He, he fights the battles on our behalf for us. He just says, trust me and stay with me. Just trust me and stay with me. And tonight, whoever needs to hear that, hear that from the Lord. Trust me and stay with me. And I will walk you through. I will not depart from you. And I will not fail you. Trust in the Lord with what? With all of your heart. With all of your heart. And circumstances and trials and fear all comes to try and shake that trust in the Lord. And the Lord says when that earth starts quaking, then you hold on tight. Close your eyes. Close your eyes to the things of the world, to the flesh, and hold on tight by faith. And just stay with me. I've got you. I'll see you through. And so the Lord is telling him, hey, I gave you a mighty victory. I want you to know they're going to be back again in the spring. So take a look around. Be wise. The Bible tells us to be wise as serpents and what? Innocent as doves. Exactly. And so here we see, be wise, the Lord giving them a heads up. We see in verse 23, it says, Then the servants of the king of Syria said to him, Their gods are gods of the hills, and therefore they were stronger than we. They're trying to figure out how they just got routed, uh, you know, with their mighty army and their 32 kings. How did they just get a shellacking here? And so they said, You know what? That we were in the hill country, and their gods are the gods of the hills. So that was an away game for us. We had to go into their home territory. So if we can play the game in, uh, in our house, if it can be a, a road game for them and a home game for us, then we will wipe them out. Uh, and so look at what he says. Their gods are gods of the hills, and therefore they were stronger than we bought if we fight against them in the plain, surely we will be stronger than they. So do this thing. Dismiss the kings, each from his position, and put captains in their places. And you shall muster an army like the army that you have lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot. Then we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we will be stronger than they. And he listened to their voice and did so. He said, okay, number one, we had 32 kings, which looked really nice with their crowns, but they're not good warriors out on the battlefield. So that was a good show. Here's what we need to do. Get rid of the kings and let's get warriors in their place. And then let's fight them on the plains instead of in the hill country and we'll take them out. And Ben Hadid goes, okay, good plan. Verse 26, and so it was in the spring of the year that Ben-Hadid mustered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were mustered and given provisions, and they went against them. Now the children of Israel encamped before them like two little flo flocks of goats, while the Syrians filled the countryside. And so uh, here we see that just uh, as the Lord had revealed, here comes Ben-Hadid and back assembles his troops. And, uh, and now here they are at Aphek. And now all of a sudden the, the army of Israel looks like two little flocks of goats. And theirs is this great multitude that is coming against them again. And then a man of God came and spoke to the king of Israel and said, thus says the Lord. Because the Syrians have said, 
The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore, I will deliver all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so and here we see that once again, the Lord's purpose was to prove to Ahab that he is the Lord. Verse 29, and they encamped opposite to each other for seven days. And so it was that on the seventh day, the battle was joined and the children of Israel killed 100,000 foot soldiers of the Syrians in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek into the city. And then a wall fell on 27,000 of the men who were left. And Ben-Hadid fled and went into the city into an inner chamber. And so here we see great calamity befalls uh, them and they are routed. And verse 31, and then his servants said to him, look now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Please let us put sackcloth around our waists and ropes around our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Perhaps he will spare your life. Now, here we see that that the kings of Israel had a reputation of being more merciful than the other kings of their day. And God wants us to walk justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. And so here we see that, uh, that this reputation had gone out before them. And so they said, let's throw ourselves on the mercy of the king. In verse 32, so they wore sackcloth around their waists and put ropes around their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, your servant Ben-Hadid says, please let me live. And he said, is he still alive? He is my brother. So here we see that Ahab calls Ben-Hadid my brother. He says, are you still alive? Of course, you're, you're my brother. And so verse 33, it says, and the men were watching closely to see whether any sign of mercy would come from him. And they quickly grasped at this word and said, your brother, Ben-Hadid. And so he said, go bring him. And then Ben-Hadid came out to him and he had him come up into the chariot. So as a gesture of friendship now, Ahab invites Ben-Hadid into his chariot, which was a position of favor. And so Ben-Hadid said to him, the cities which my father took from your father, I will restore. And you may set up marketplaces for yourself in Damascus as my father did in Samaria. And then Ahab said, I will send you away with this treaty. And so he made a treaty with them and sent him away. Now he was quick, Ahab was, to placate his enemy. And Ben-Hadid now pledged to return the cities that his father had taken from Ahab's father, from his, prededa from his prededa predecessor, um, Besha. Verse 35, now a certain man of the sons of the prophets said to his neighbor by the word of the Lord, strike me, please. And the man refused to, to strike him. And then he said to him, because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, surely, as soon as you depart from me, a lion shall kill you. And as soon as he left him, a lion found him and killed him. We see here that, uh, that the friend's refusal, though understandable, was a direct act of disobedience against the Lord. In verse 37, it says, and he found another man and said, strike me, please. And so the man struck him, inflicting a wound. And then the prophet departed and waited for the king by the road and disguised himself with a bandage over his eyes. Now, as the king passed by, he cried out to the king and said, your servant went out into the midst of the battle. And there a man came over and brought a man to me and said, guard this man. If by any means he is missing, your life shall be for his life or else you shall pay a talent of silver. And while your servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And then the king of Israel said to him, so, so shall your judgment be. You yourself have decided it. In verse 41, it says, and he hastened to take the bandage away from his eyes 
And the king of Israel recognized him as one of the prophets. And then he said to him, thus says the Lord, because you have let slip out of your hand a man who I appointed to utter destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life and your people for his people. And so we see here that just as in Nathan's story to David, we see the king responded to the prophet in words that ended up judging himself. And so the king of Israel went to his house, and sullen and displeased, and, and came to Samaria. And so he is frustrated and angry because of the prophecy. You see, the Assyrians were beginning to rise in power. And so what was happening is that King Ahab wanted to be able to form a treaty with the Syrians, with Ben-Hadid, so that they would be able to join together to protect Israel from the Assyrian threat that was beginning. But God was bringing judgment upon the Syrians, and we see that, uh, that now Ahab was disobedient to the Lord because he was working out his own plan. And we see that he wasn't trusting God and being obedient to him. And so in our lives, may we not be making treaties that we shouldn't be entering into. May we not be compromising, seeking our own wisdom. But may we just simply yield. Just trust the Lord with what God wants to do in your life. And just be led by him, being fully obedient to him in the things that he reveals. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And God, we ask that you would continue to minister to each and every one of us. Bless us, God. Meet us right where we're at. Fill us afresh, God. Empower us for the battle. Give us victory. We carry your banner. Lord, strengthen us this day. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.